afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to the webinar, Sparking Conversations About Race and Equity with Adult English Learners. So before I turn it over to our rock star presenter, I want to introduce our partners at English Discoveries. This is Jill Roselak. So Jill. Hi. All right. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go from there. All right, let me make sure, there we go. All right, hello and welcome everyone. English Discoveries is very proud to be a sponsor for today's session. Um, I, again, I am Jill Roslick and a little bit before we get started here, I'm just gonna tell you about our platform and our curriculum. English Discoveries is, oops, there we go. I need to go to my next slide and it's not doing it. There we go. No, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, English Discoveries is your complete English language learning solution. And it's used by over 2 million students worldwide every day. Our core curriculum is academic and rigorous and aligned to all your major um, content curriculum standards. And instead of just telling you about our platform, I do want to show you a video. Let's give, it, give you a peek at our curriculum and the platform, and here we go. Welcome to English Discoveries, the complete English language learning solution. English Discoveries is developed by EduSoft, a subsidiary of Educational Testing Services. ETS is the world's largest private educational assessment and research organization and creator of the TOEFL and TOEIC tests. EduSoft's experience in English language learning, combined with ETS's recognized leadership in the world of assessment, provides the most effective English learning solution in the market today. English Discoveries is a customizable end-to-end -end assessment and learning solution providing students and educators with effective and user-friendly tools to maximize learning outcomes. Our solution provides an effective core curriculum in both distance and blended learning environments. The English Discoveries interactive learning platform delivers a complete cutting-edge learning experience with field-proven pedagogical approaches. Automated feedback helps students develop their speaking and writing skills. English Discoveries provides a variety of formative and summative assessment opportunities in line with the highest industry standards. A data-driven learning environment provides actionable information to enable teachers and administrators to improve learning outcomes. English Discovery's classroom materials reflect and reinforce the teaching objectives of the online learning content and promote communicative interaction in face-to-face -face and synchronous classrooms. EduSoft's professional development solutions provide teachers with the tools and skills necessary to make the most of our distance and blended learning models. Our implementation teams work hand in hand with our customers to ensure your learning goals are reached. We provide ongoing pedagogical consultation, account management services, and technical support. To learn more about how the English Discoveries solution can take your English program to the next level, contact us today. All right, thank you for watching that. I also wanted to let you know that in addition to um, our, oops, let me go back, um, our core curriculum, our academic portions, we also have a lot of career pathways information for your IET, pre-IET students um, with two different groups of courses. Our first one is integrated instruction 
featuring uh, terminology and employability concepts. And these are just some examples of the career pathways that, that those are available in. And we also have a very specific health science topics work that features work on reading, writing, and um, those higher level computer skills where students are using a word processor and emailing these attachments to a teacher and getting feedback. So it's really, we really are a full service, full curriculum platform. And I wanna thank you so much for your time and attention. And if you would like to have some more information about English discoveries, please feel free to scan this QR code and this will give you my contact information, a link to the website and lots of other information. And again, thank you so much for your time and uh, enjoy your presentation today. I'm it's gonna be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, English Discoveries. We value your our partnership so much. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Karen Bates. So, Karen? Thank you so much, Bethel and Jill. Um, I really appreciate Kaleb inviting me to be here today. And it's wonderful to see everybody that's in the chat, where you're all from, and um, I'm so excited to be here. So let me share my screen. We'll get started. All right. Can everybody see okay? And I'm going to try to pay attention to the to the chat as well, because I will have some things that I would like to um, to share with you in that. So one more second here for me to get something set up. OK. And yeah, Bethel, if you see questions on someone that come up in the chat, let me know. And uh, it might help to have that moderated a little bit. So I am Karen Bates. Um, I actually got an upgrade in title that's effective July 1st. So I'm going to use it. I am now the TESOL specialist with Intercambio Uniting Communities. We are located in Boulder, Colorado and have um, schools in Boulder County um, all over uh, in, in the cities of Longmont, Lafayette and Boulder. And um, we've been uh, a school for adult English language learners for the past 23 years. And um, we like to share at national conferences about the things that we've learned as a school and the things that we are developing um, through our program that we have. So, um, so that's um, a little bit about the history of our school. Our mission and vision are the following, that we hope to bring English learners and community volunteers together in language classes and gatherings to build skills, confidence, and life-changing connections. And we have a philosophy that we call the Intercambio Way, which is creating spaces for relationship-based learning, which values all participants' experiences and builds a more equitable future. So that's a little of the perspective that I'm coming from um, as, as a TESOL specialist with, um, with Intercambio. So something that we provide um, for people is a curriculum, a six-level curriculum that's very affordable that can be taught by volunteers. Something else that's unique about our program is we are 100% volunteer based. And so we want the curriculum to be accessible for people who may not even have a background in teaching English to speakers of other languages. We offer support for starting or running a volunteer based program as well. And we have opportunities for connection and collaboration with other ESOL organizations through our um, through our membership that we have. So that's a little bit about the organization that I come from. I've been working there for the past uh, two and a half years. I'll give a little more about my background in just a moment, but I wanna give um, the objective, objectives for this session, um, the things that I hope that you, will, that you will get out of it. So I hope during this session that you will increase your awareness about starting conversations um, on race and equity in your classes. Um, I hope that you will be able to build your confidence to try this out or expand on what you're already doing. Um, I hope to share resources with you to learn more and also provide you with tools um, to uh, help make these conversations um, more effective and also share some resources with you. So speaking of resources, um, I'm going to attempt here to put in the chat if I can find my different places. Okay, there you'll, you'll see the links I'm going to share with you a little bit here on my notepad. But let me go ahead and copy this one and put it in the chat. This is a resource guide that I developed for this presentation. Um, it's a 90 minute workshop, but I have had to um, bring it down to 
as little as 45 minutes. <laughs> so, um, oh, and Devona, yeah, I just saw your message that you were at the MPAEA conference. So I'm so glad to see you here. That is awesome. So here's the resource guide. It's, I mean, it's more than 20 pages long and it basically has all of the information that you're gonna have in the presentation today. Um, you know, but you can you can use this um, uh, to to follow along with if you want to open up the PDF. Um, but it's something that you can you can print off as well. So I'm going to talk about three main things, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q and A. We'll see how it goes here. <laughs> There's a lot of information I'd like to share, um, but I want to focus on why this is an important effort first. I want to focus on ways to create an environment for these conversations to take place. And I'm going to share with you some specific curriculum and resources that you can use to promote um, conversations on race and equity. So, and Steve, I noticed that you said you have a question on how you're going to set and enforce ground rules for having these conversations. I will cover that. So just hold, hold tight and we'll get to it. Okay, so I think it's really important, especially because I'm a white woman named Karen, to explain why me? Why am I doing this? Who am I and what is my connection? to this particular material. So um, I just want you to know I've taught ESOL to various learners from little kids in kindergarten, adults, academic English programs, adult basic education since 1990. So I've been at this work. Um, this is my um, 34th year of doing this work. Um, social justice work started for me in the 1990s, um, especially with some amazing teachers that I had at the University of Colorado at Denver um, some of you in the bilingual education world might know Ka Dr. Kathy Escamilla. She was integral in introducing um, concepts to me about social justice. But for me, it did also really culminate in the summer of 2020, um, of course, with the murder of George Floyd. And it activated me. It really turned me on to not only become a strong anti-racist ally, but to be an accomplice. So let me share um, a little bit about what an accomplice means. I have another link to that here. So let me pull that link up for you. Oh, I did have a link to it. I don't have the link. You can click on it when you receive this presentation. Actually, I might be able to, uh, let's see, I might be able to copy it here from my notes. Give me just a second. Oh, not quite. Okay, I'll get, I'll provide that for you if I can at the end of the presentation. Um, but basically, being an accomplice means that not only are you um, using your privilege to stand alongside as an ally, but you're challenging the existing conditions and risking your own comfort and well-being to sort of dismantle um, things on an institutional level, not just an individual level. So I'm working on that. That being an accomplice is something that is that is for me. Um, complex and involved. Um, and I'm working on that. Um, giving these presentations is actually a piece of that. So I'm thankful to be here to be able to do that. Um, I've done a lot of workshops, training, self-education, curriculum development, addressing justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, hours and hours of it. So um, I should probably add up those hours to find out you know, exactly um, how much time I've spent doing the work, but it has been extensive for me. And the things that I do on a regular basis to step up is to educate, continue, continue to educate myself, to engage in self-analysis, to listen, to challenge the status quo and ignorance when I'm confronted with it, and taking action where I can. I'm definitely still learning, definitely still a, a person working on this um, and in progress. So that's a little bit of a who am I and why am I doing this? So I just want you to reflect for a moment as kind of a warm up. What do you think of when you think of the words race and equity? And also, what do you hope to get out of this presentation? So if you feel comfortable to put those things in the chat, you can. But I'm going to give you a moment if you have a little piece of paper you're taking notes on. I would just like you to write down, what do you think of when you think of race and equity? And what do you hope that you can learn? And I see that there are um, some folks that put in the chat here, Oh yeah, I was looking back at Steve's. Um, Steve says like, how how does everyone feel heard and not offended? Yeah, we're gonna talk about that. So if you think of something like Steve did in the chat, what do you hope to get out of the presentation like this? Angela says civil rights and history, excellent. Yeah, division for learning equal parts. Oh, if for equity, mm -hmm. we need to get comfortable talking about race. It's like a muscle, we have to exercise it, excellent. How institutionalized 
race and maybe inequity is in the United States. It's a political division. It's a socially constructed, um, uh, social construct of, created to divide groups based on skin color. Yeah, that's how I would probably define race as well. Thoughts about how to begin. Annalisa, yes, we're definitely going to talk about how to begin this. Um, equity is creating fairness, taking into account both current and historical circumstances. Justice for the people who have um, uh, come out of enslavement, backgrounds of enslavement. How everyone is treated or lives equitably based on color of skin. Um, so it takes the work to dismantle those systems. Yeah, everyone gets what they need to succeed. I like that, Deanna. That's the, the definition I use too. And how do I engage my ASL students in conversations about race? You are in the right spot. That's what we're going to talk about. I'll let you keep putting things in chat. I may come back to them and look in just a minute, but I'm going to keep moving on here. Okay, so just also a little bit of a note about the current climate. Um, we started giving these presentations in 2021, 2022. A lot has shifted in the past three you know, or so years. One of those things is that there have been, um, oh, basically sort of, I guess you could say attacks on talking about race in classrooms, um, on the, the issue of like, what does critical race theory mean? And so I'm kind of putting a little disclaimer in here that, um, you know, I do recognize that there are many hot button issues uh, with conversations on race and equity, but I'm also not a legal expert. I'm a teacher and a, a TESOL specialist. So um, I don't have the capacity to speak to this in, in legal terms. It seems that most of this legislation is, is focused on K-12 schools and some universities at this point. Uh, in adult education, I think some of it depends on the state you're living in and the funding that you received um, or that you received for your programs. And really, you need to use your best judgment and consult with your, you know, the people that are in your school, consult with your superiors, talk this through with them to find out what are your, what are your boundaries and what, you know, there are teachers who've been fired for talking about these things in education. So I'm just mindful of that. Um, this on the left is a map from educationweek.org. And the, the blue is that there has been a bill signed into law that limits conversations on race or conversations um, regarding critical race theory, to which I put a definition down here. So you can read that too for yourself to understand what it is and what it isn't. Um, the red is that the bills had been vetoed, overturned, or stalled indefinitely. Um, the gray is that there's no state level action or bill introduced. And then um, the dark blue is that a bill has been introduced and is moving through state legislature. But that's about from a year ago when I could find the most updated data. Um, that link, if you click on it, there is a paywall at ed, um, edweek.org, um, but you can usually get one or two articles for free. So later on, when you receive maybe a copy of this presentation, if you want to click on that and get some updated information, that was the most recent that I could find um, for the COAID presentation that occurred this last spring. So um, so just so you know, that's, you know, I'm cognizant of all of these things and you should be too. Okay, so I wanna start from something that I got out of Share My Lesson. Um, Share My Lesson, I do have a link that I remember putting here, is from the Air American Federation of Teachers that's focused a lot on K-12 education. Um, but there are some excellent resources and things that I receive in emails from them. So there's sharemylesson.com. And something that they mentioned are, are, are things to be mindful of when having discussions in class about potentially high conflict um, topics. And so they are to do the following things. Ensure that the classroom environment is a safe or brave space. And I'll explain a little more about what that is in a moment. Facilitate respectfully. So we need to navigate these conversation in a manner that honors multiple perspectives, avoid stereotypes or biases, and engage what um, we like to talk about at Intercambio as engaging cultural humility. We have a whole separate presentation on that um, that I give as well at different conferences. But essentially, it means that you are putting yourself in a place of um, receiving. It's a mindset. It's a mindset where you want to um, think think through things with that with that humility and so realizing that you have a lot to learn and and have a certain degree of openness um, you need to be prepared to provide support and resources so students might need more information or space help for their emotions and it's important to do your work beforehand so that you're conversant in a lot of these issues 
um, so that you do know where the resources are and you are able to provide them to students. And also it's really important to allow time for reflection. Um, adult students need time to share and process what they're learning and especially around conversations on race and equity. So let's talk a little bit about why it's important to talk about this. And um, basically it's because our students are experiencing discrimination and racism and talking about it can help. Um, there is a good article um, from a couple of authors in 2019 called The Effects of Perceived Discrimination on Immigrant and Refugee Physical and Mental Health. And I've got a, a link to that too. I'm gonna copy that real quick and I'll put that in the chat. I think I closed the chat. Let me open the chat. <laughs> If I can find it here. There we go. Okay, here's that article. And, you know, in essence, um, our students are experiencing this and it can be major stressors for them impacting their health, especially if you're working with immigrants and refugees who are the, the adult um, English language learners, right? Um, skin tone and English language proficiency impacts the experiences of discrimination and there's been um, data that's been collected that says that people having darker skin tones and lower language proficiency are actually that's linked to increased levels of, disc of discrimination so you can read more about that in this um, in this medical article um, that tied these things together so you know if our if our learners are experiencing this I think it's important that we um, do due diligence and, and um, be there to have these conversations so that they can begin to unpack what's going on. So here are some other reasons. Um, there is still a movement happening. I think that um, there's been a lot of backlash about that movement, um, but we can still be a part of it and we can still be a part of moving it forward. Students are better equipped to recognize and stand up to racism if they know facts and history when they share their experiences and perspectives, they actually learn English faster because it has to, you know, it has to do with that personalization, right? There's important language that students need to learn. And teachers also can to learn directly from their students' experiences, right? It's this is that mutual or two-way learning that Intercambio really likes to emphasize in our program and with our volunteer teachers, is that the teachers are not there to disseminate knowledge to the students. They are also there to receive information from them about the perspective of, of immigrants coming in, about the perspectives of um, people from other cultures, from other backgrounds. Um, and we would like to encourage social cohesion in our community. And when you have volunteers coming in and language students coming together, they can have a very lovely, um, it can be a lovely pairing where there is this kind of mutual exchange. And it increases all of our sense of belonging and connection when we can talk honestly and transparently about these things. Um, and then any more ideas about why this is important? If you want to put something in the chat about, you know, why do you think it's important to talk about race and equity in the classroom? Um, I welcome to see your thoughts there. I'll kind of keep the chat open here and, and uh, peek and see what you have to say. Wait a second, I keep closing my chat and then I can't find it. There it is. Okay, <laughs> so excellent. All right. Of course, there's a lot of reasons why teachers might not want to talk about race and equity in classes. So good. Yeah, Susan, you said it helps to understand um, more about culture in the United States. Culture is very broad, right? There's not one culture in the United States. There's multiple cultures, but it absolutely can help our learners understand more about that. Um, Lisa says the conversations going on all around them. They need to be a part of it. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for sharing. So, but they're also, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I'm hesitant. And of course we might feel hesitant. These are, these are hot topics, aren't they? So some people are afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing. I know I am and have been. Like, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. I know that I probably will, but it's not a comfortable feeling, isn't it? Okay. Some people don't want to risk hurting others' feelings when having a conversation about race. Kind of related to the first point there. Teachers may not know how to have these conversations to safely facilitate them. And the perception might be that the vocabulary or content level is just too advanced. And then I actually took a poll at COABE um, to find out what are some other reasons why teachers might feel 
uncomfortable about this. And this is some of the, the poll results right here. So what is it you fear most about conversations on race and equity with your adult language learners? And people answered this um, in the, the Whova app uh, as they attended the COAID conference. And, and you can see some of them here. They don't want to sound racist, right? It's awkward. It feels uncomfortable. There might be miscommunication that results. Um, again, not able to understand that's language barriers, misunderstandings. Um, it can introduce a conflict. Addie says in the chat, white fragility, absolutely, is often a barrier. Yeah, yeah. And that, like, I haven't, I'm not gonna describe what that is, but uh, Google, Google's your friend in this case. Google, Google white fragility, if you're not familiar with the term to understand uh, more about that. Doing a lot of research on your own is something really important to do. Um, I like this one here, though here it says, my biggest fear is when people stop having these conversations. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, so that's a little bit about um, why people might feel uncomfortable. Here's something that um, is an example. This actually came up in a classroom. And I would just like you to, to think about um, what if this came up in your class? How would you feel if, um, how would you handle this? How could you make use of this comment as a learning opportunity. So this is what the student said. I've noticed that African Americans in the US use bad grammar. What I usually do um, when I workshop this is have people get into small groups and talk about it. And this is more of a webinar style here. So we can't do that. But I would like you to think about this. What would you do? What would you do? Um, I like in the chat, possibly discuss AAVE, which stands for African American Vernacular English. Yeah, it's a language. It's an authentic, linguistically recognized language. And, you know, um, this is an opportunity to talk about it. Talk about registers of language and dialects. Everybody uses bad grammar. Yeah, we've had, when I workshop this, a lot of times students or um, teacher participants will say, you know, the keyword there is really bad and unpacking what that word means. Um, changing it from, they use different grammar and how it's legitimate. Yes, Kathleen, this is exactly what I was gonna say. A lot of times um, people, when I'm workshop workshopping this, draw parallels between different dialects of English and also different dialects of other languages like Spanish, Arabic. And we can say, you know, are there dialects where you come from in the language that you speak that's your home language? And, um, and unpacking that a little bit. So, but this is, these are the kinds of opportunities that come up in classrooms, right? Just these offhand things that a student might say, um, you know, and, and yes, just unpacking, what does this word bad mean? Bad is a, is, it's a qualifier, isn't it? It's an opinion statement. You can talk about facts versus opinions um, with, the, with the learners. And what can you look at factually and what's an opinion? So moving on though, it, we, we want to create this brave space, right? Because we know that, that topics like this are going to come up. They're going to come up in the way that I just uh, shared. And if we, if we have a classroom that is already a safe and brave space for having these conversations, we can um, open up. So number one thing, and I've mentioned this already, is really to do the work yourself and engage in continued learning on your own. So understanding what does racism mean? What is race? What is racism? What do we mean by equity? And how is it different from equality? Bias, what's the difference between explicit, overt, and implicit or hidden bias? And what I do is like, like you're doing here, this is a great opportunity to do this. Sign up for all the webinars you can on the topic and read as many books as you have capacity for. Um, follow teachers and leaders on social media platforms like Instagram. And I mentioned and, and copied off quite a few um, suggestions of people to follow and places to get training in that resource guide link. Um, so I would, you know, um, just keep, keep doing the work on your own to raise your own awareness of these issues. Okay. I just want to say that no space is 100% safe, but we can make it safer. And I, there are seven basic ways, of course, there's more than seven, but I like this number. Here's seven ways <laughs> to create a brave speech, which is a safe container for courageous conversations. You do want to set expectations and ground rules and revisit them often. And I'll share what some of those are. That was Stephen's um, comment earlier about knowing how to do that. 
establish a connection before diving into intense topics. You have to have good relationship with your learners. Start off with some easy stuff to build trust in your classroom so that they know that it's a safe place. You do want to give people an opportunity to pass or opt out. In no way should anyone ever feel obligated to speak about these issues. Um, and so it's really important um, when having these conversations, if someone does not want to share, that's okay. Um, it's important to remain neutral, to listen, to paraphrase, and to model respect. Employ cultural humility. So I am going to speak on that in just a moment, a little more. I've mentioned it already. Um, really learn how to pronounce your participant names and read body language. This is something that just in general is really good practice, especially when you're working with adult English language learners, right? Pronouncing names is, is cr crucial. Try your best. Um, it's okay if you make mistakes, but do try. Don't change your students' names to an English name unless it's at the request of the student. There are some students, um, when I lived and worked in China, for example, you know, I had many students with very interesting names that they chose. <laughs> like I had a Snow and I had a Lincoln and, you know, and, and this was names that they, of their own, they wanted to feel that they had an identity in English as well and of their own free will chose those names to be used. And, you know, that's, that's okay. But otherwise, you know, use the name that they've been given um, and try to do the whole thing. And reading body language, that's, you know, we, we teachers become adept at that. Um, really know when to stop or dig deeper with questions. You need to read the room and be sensitive. It's, this is something that I think is learned by practice and by making mistakes. So when you haven't read the room and you've pushed deeper and it, you know, something blows up in your face, that's, that's a good experience, right, to understand how to take the temperature of that room. But you can take, um, you know, you can do attend webinars on social emotional learning. You can expand by doing good reading about how to become more sensitive to, to the surroundings and how your students are feeling. Okay, so here's what a brave space can look like. Um, this comes from the website facinghistory.org. It's an untitled poem by Beth Strano. And what I've done, um, I am also part of the DEIA task force at Intracombio. And a lot of times we invoke this as an opening kind of recitation to set the mood. And so I'm just gonna read it for you right now. There's no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and have caused wounds. This space seeks to turn down the volume of the world outside and amplify voices that have to fight to be heard elsewhere. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our space together and we will work on it side by side. So I invite you into this type of space for this webinar now, um, and that we will work on this side by side together in this um, thing that we're doing here today. Okay, here's some ground rules for discussions. These are guidelines for having these conversations. Um, one is to have this class mantra, and I'll, I'll get to that point in just a minute, but it is important, I think, to talk with your students about how everyone in the class comes from different backgrounds. And so we're here to learn together and from one another. If we set that as a ground rule, we are here to learn together and, and from one another. You could even say this at the beginning of class, right? Every day, we are here to learn together and from one another. Um, and even I think at the most basic levels of English, we can we can unpack this. We can help people use translate to translate what this means, right? But this is this is a part of being in a classroom where there are many different cultures and cultural backgrounds. Talk about coming into the space, the classroom space, with more curiosity and less judgment. Help everyone understand, everyone understand that mistakes are okay and in fact necessary to learning. We learn through our mistakes. And setting that tone is helpful as just as much for English grammar as it is for cross-cultural interchange. Listen respectfully. Model that, especially, right, for students. And they will, they will capture what you are modeling. Uh, but you can, you can do some lessons. Of how do we listen respectfully to someone else from another culture? There might be 
um, students who need to learn that. You can look that up. That's Googleable information about, you know, how to actively listen, how to listen more respectfully. You can go over those um, guidelines with your students. Respect confidentiality. So that's sort of what's said in this classroom stays in this classroom. Um, you know, create that confidentiality and trust with one another through activities of getting to know one another, um, building those relationships, building that rapport, but then also saying, you know, what we say here in discussions that are sensitive needs to stay in this classroom. Let students know that they can ask for clarification if they're confused. This is important because, you know, confusion and misunderstanding can come up. So if you've got a safe space for people to say, I'm confused, I don't understand, um, that's wonderful because then we can clear up somebody silent probably has the same misunderstanding. Use I statements. Speak from your own experience without generalizing. This is a hard one because a lot of, you know, students will come along. In Thailand, all Thai people or in Saudi Arabia, all Saudi people, you know, it's, it's, there's in my culture and it's kind of this, you know, global thing. And we know that there are individuals within cultures and that not everything is hundred percent uniform. So teach students to speak. I feel, I experience, I, you know, using those I statements instead of generalizing in my home, in my community, in my neighborhood, right? Get specific that way and train them to, to have conversations in that manner. Make sure that, that students give um, others the opportunity to speak and expect to feel uncomfortable. That's for everybody. We will sometimes feel uncomfortable when having these. Okay. And then this class mantra over here, you know, you can create some kind of poster, maybe write something down with these guidelines, share with one another, figure out ways to, um, you know, to, uh, negotiate some of these. Their students might have other wonderful ideas, but you can kind of put these on a poster um, in your room and 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 adhere to these guidelines, right? Okay, cultural humility. Let's just talk a little bit about that. There's a great video on YouTube. Um, what is cultural humility by Site Cub, and it explains in about two minutes. <laughs> so it's a wonderful thing. Um, Cultural competency is kind of a toolbox. It's a checklist. Do this and don't do this. Take your shoes off when you walk into a Japanese home. Um, you know, that there's there's this kind of like knowledge that we can have or skills that we can have. It's contrasted with cultural humility, which is more of a mindset. And it's where you're continuously reflecting on your own biases and how you treat and understand others. It's where you become more aware of power imbalances. A classic power imbalance in the classroom is that often the teacher is here and the student is here. And how can you become aware of that and start to shift that? It's really recognizing that there is no culture and no person that is superior or inferior. Um, and sometimes that's something that we not only have to work on inside of ourselves, but help introduce to other people in our classrooms as well. It's a state of curiosity and ongoing learning about other cultures. And it's honesty and openness about what you haven't learned yet, or just basically, you don't know what you don't know. So you just have to say, you know what, I know I haven't learned things yet and I'm open to learning more. Um, one thing that you can do too, to kind of sensitize yourself a little more and sensitize your students is to learn how to avoid potentially offensive words. Inclusive language is really important when you're trying to cultivate a brave space because words matter. And so here's some alternative language for you. Some things that maybe a couple of these you haven't thought about. Some of them you probably have, others you may not have. First is the term illegal immigrants, right? Um, at Intercambio, we emphasize and stress undocumented. Borders are all made up anyway, aren't they? Right? So, um, and I think the big, the big complaint that people have about the term illegal immigrant is that there's no such thing as an illegal human. We're all human beings. Some of us may be documented, some of us may not be. How about the word American? This one's used a lot. However, America comprises Canada, Mexico, Central America, South America. Which America? Okay, so if we differentiate United States or US American, we are honoring then all the other Americans that live in the Western Hemisphere, right? So I myself have stopped trying to use the term American so much because I recognize that to be American means to be Canadian, means to be Mexican, means to be 
Central American, South American, and all the countries there. Assimilation. Okay, sometimes we hear this in the, the, the field of TESOL, um, that we want students to assimilate. Well, there's some very, very negative connotations with that word. It means to erase your own culture and become completely like the, the target culture that you're living in. Um, I prefer to use the word participation or integration um, because of the, the heavy, you know, when we, when we think of assimilation, we think of, um, I think of the Native American boarding schools, Indian boarding schools that occurred in Canada and the United States where language was stripped from children who were not there um, of their own volition. Um, and it connotates other things as well um, that are that are very negative. So I've stepped away from um, using that term. So having these kinds of discussions about words is a part of brave conversations. And I saw I seen there the word integration. I think integration there's there's a sociological sort of term about it. When you look at the definition of it, um, integration implies to me from the education that I received is that you keep a lot of your own culture while also trying to embrace the target culture and you sort of you maintain um, a bit of a bit of both. So and there's, you know, there's some controversy over the word integration as well, but I don't have time to get into that. <laughs> so I'm going to try to race through in about 15 more minutes here. So but you can you can look it up. Yeah, I like that integration disguise itself as inclusion. Yeah, there's there's again, this is a presentation that we're doing in an hour. Um, I've spent you know, at least 30, 40, 50 hours doing this work. Um, and it can it can go into a lot of depth. But this is exactly the kind of thing that you can have conversations with people about. What do you think about this word integration? How is that acceptable? How is it unacceptable? And recognize that inclusive language shifts and changes, doesn't it? So let's get to how we can start having these conversations in the classroom. Um, here's some opportunities, right? You can integrate them into existing classes. One way that I did this with intro level students was over beginning um, level citizenship questions. You know how there's the reading and writing for the citizenship test and those sentences. Um, there's a lot of embedded conversations on race and equity that could come out of that material, even with um, intro level students. So you can integrate this into what you're doing. It can happen organically where just stuff comes up. Stuff came up in the citizenship materials that we had an opportunity to talk about. Um, it can be more formal. You can dedicate a part of class or a, an ex actually create an existing, you know, a class on these subjects. They can be these separate conversation classes. Um, I'll let you generate and think of some other ideas um, on your own. It's just something for you to think about. Here's how we can structure. It's important to choose some source material. If you're going to do this like as a, as a conversation, that's that's set aside it's not just organically coming up in the class but you want to create some source material you can find short and simple videos online you can maybe find an article perhaps adapted by the teacher this is something where um, i've used ai to adapt articles um, to simplify them to a reading level that's accept, um, accessible by the learners that i'm working with Select and pre-teach key vocabulary and pronunciation that's building that background knowledge. Make sure to present facts, not personal opinions. That's tricky. I <laughs> know sometimes I have strong opinions about what equity is, for example. Um, and but I have to be, you know, you have to be careful to kind of find as much factual information as you can. Create discussion questions for the material. Put students into small groups to discuss the questions. And then prompt students to share about their own personal experiences, hopes, and dreams that are connected to the information. You can ask about similarities or differences in the country where they grew up. That's another way that we frame it. Instead of saying, what's this like in your culture? Culture is nuanced, right? It's not a monolith. What was this like where you grew up? That's more specific to the learner. Okay, here's a video example. This is in the resource packet. I won't go through um, all of this information because we don't have time to do it and it's not set up so much as a workshop in this webinar. But you could you could ask learners, what's being shown in this video? Um, oh, this, sorry, this is for you. You need to go through the video and, and ask yourself, what exactly, what concept is being shown in this video? What vocabulary and concepts would you choose to focus on? 
um, what discussion questions would you create for the video? It's called Our Hidden Biases. You can um, click on it when you receive the information. Um, the QR code actually, I think, links to that video. Um, and it's something, this would be an example that you could use with learners. Okay, another source is um, blackpass.org. I found a lot of wonderful historical information um, and, and issues and events pertaining to race, racism, civil rights, protest, and so on. Um, there is an article on the Montgomery bus boycott. And so again, you, as a teacher, before you share this information with students, you want to know what's being described. How would you adapt the article if you, if you need to, depending on the level of your students? What vocabulary and concepts would you focus on? What discussion questions would you create about it? And does this article need to be adapted? So, and here's some sample questions for discussion that get at the students' perspectives and, and things that they want to learn about. So, um, but here it's, do you know of a time when people from your birthplace protested something? Is there a famous story about protest in the country where you were born? Why is that st story so special to you and your heritage? Um, and then there's a second question, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks protested to end segregation in the United States. What would you like to see change in the United States or world? Why? Well, they need to know what is protest? Both of those questions contain protests. So doing some work about what does protest mean? Who are Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks? What is segregation? Okay, all of these things would be important for the learner to be able to have conversations about this. So it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to unpack, right, and process. And ideally, the content should be student-centric and based on questions that they have. And you can therefore give students surveys or use informal discussions to kind of gauge what, they, what they're curious about and to determine what topics to cover. There's a really good um, old, now old, resource from Elsa Roberts Arbach calling, called Making Meaning, Making Change, Participatory Curriculum for Adult ESL Literacy. Um, she has this beautiful section in that book, which is available at the link there, um, that where it, how to consciously listen to students for issues, problems, or concerns. And um, pages 96 and 98 of that publication, dealing with difficult student themes and issues is really helpful when even not talking about race and equity. Um, it's just when difficult topics come up in the classroom, um, this is a great resource to check into. So here's a few more things, a few more, a bit of advice that I have about this. Um, Firstbook.org has some wonderful PDFs that you can download to learn more. And Empowering Educators, a guidebook on race and racism on the left um, has three main components to it. It emphasizes doing your inner work, understanding history, increasing your awareness and acknowledging your bias, doing the outer work, um, structuring your lesson plans around um, how to be more anti-racist and recognizing um, how we can align curriculum that is um, more open to diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, use the power of literature to lead with positive, not trauma-based narratives. So um, use this lens to, to um, choose books. They have um, a guide about how to do that. And then in challenging conversations about race and racism, um, the things that are talked about in this publication are defining terms, connecting the past to the present, um, which is really important because there's a lot of present day issues that are going on that students are curious about, and you've got to understand the through line to those, right? Um, we want to provide options, help learners think critically, talk about structural racism and white privilege, encourage empathy, inspire hope and activism. And this book also has guidelines on facilitating conversations. So that's a stepping off point from what I'm sharing with you today about what you can learn more of. Okay, so I want to introduce to you something that um, that Intercombio put together called Conversations on Race and Equity. This is um, material that you could use with advanced learners. It's designed for NRS proficiency levels five to six. I didn't align it to CASA steps yet, so this is based on the old CASA's life and work reading, um, but 210 to 235, so those kind of a little bit advanced suffer around B1 to B2. It's curriculum that's focused on the history of African-Americans in the United States, led by um, an African-American woman 
uh, named Courtney Napier. I'll share a little more about her. It's designed for two-way learning of the facilitator and participants. So you absolutely can have a white man or white woman <laughs> facilitating because they are going to learn just as much as the students. And this can be really valuable if you have a volunteer-led um, program. And that we found that the instructors who participate this, the facilitators that participate, um, have learned as much or more than the students. So here's Courtney. I love Courtney. She is on Instagram. You can follow her. Um, I can't remember her Instagram handle right off the bat, but if you just uh, Google Courtney Deepier, her Instagram will come up. Um, she created five 10 minute videos for Intercombio based on a grant that we had. And they were designed to be um, used with in person discussion events. Um, which got waylaid by COVID. <laughs> so, um, so we we had this beautiful material, these five videos on race and racism. Um, the people in parentheses are are the historical um, personas, the people, the the historical people that she presents about um, when talking about these major topics. But she goes through race and racism, abolition, segregation, protest, and intersectionality, and discusses the people that you see in parentheses, giving their life history, a little mini bio within these 10 minute videos. And what I did is I said, this material is gold. This could be used as a curriculum. We don't need to do discussion events. They weren't that successful. They were a little too advanced for let's say a level two, three or four learner. Um, but what could we do to, to make this more understandable for learners? And so what I did is I set up 15 class lessons um, where I took the 10 minute video and divided them into three parts and also gave some bonus materials that connect to music of the time period that's being talked about, music from African Americans. And, um, and here's a curriculum that you could do in a couple of months with your learners. This is kind of based on two hour classes. And the components, you know, it's designed to create this brave space where participants can explore topics related to race and equity while improving their English skills. So we have language objectives. Learning vocabulary is a huge part of it, but also increasing speaking fluency, building confidence, practicing listening comprehension through Courtney's videos, and increasing writing fluency through journal topics. And the content objectives, this is content-based learning. Um, it's history. Um, but uh, participants, including the facilitator, the teacher, will increase their awareness of history of race in the United States, and they will increase their awareness of bias and assumptions, and gain a better understanding of important events and people in U.S. history related to those five areas. This is what the students have had to say who participated um, through Intercombio and also a couple of pilot um, pilot classes that we had. It was amazing. Right? And it was a 101 class on racism, everything that you want to learn about its origins and its impact in America it helps you empathize with others and be aware of a problem that still exists. So um, this was the advice from students, you know, please take the opportunity. I'm sure these classes will help you a lot. Um, just a few student quotes uh, who have participated in this program. Um, you can get this. It's for free. It is on our website. It's downloadable. I have at least a couple people a week who are still find out about it and still downloading it. Um, but it is for free. It's still in a pilot phase. So you can use this QR code. Um, I did not copy this chat <laughs> for the chat. So that you can just go to intercombio.org org slash form. I cannot talk slash form slash core um, and receive it or just scan that QR code on your phone. And that is that I have um, this is this is where I am. Um, there is a little survey. I actually left that in there, but I realized later that um, I don't think that survey has this particular presentation <laughs> um, that's that's linked there. But you can just choose that you went to the core. Co just choose the COAB core. I think that one is still on there um, and we'll know from the date of participation. Um, we just love your feedback about what you thought about this. And if you want to contact me, I'm available at Karen at intercombio.org. And I just wanna kind of open up to questions. It looks like here, um, we'll receive the recording and get the notes. Um, yeah, I know that um, COAB always provides um, everything that you need um, uh, from these sessions. So, because I've participated in many myself. So good, I, I answered that live, I will click that. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, if there's any more questions or anything that you would like to address, um, uh, let me know. 
I invite you to, um, to check the core materials out and see if they would be useful um, for your classes. So Bethel, anything, can we, are we able to take live questions via audio in this? Uh, we are not. It's set okay. up like a webinar. Um, yeah, okay. I did I... save the chat for you. So I'll send oh, it excellent. to you, Karen. Um, and yeah. then anybody who has questions can reach out to Karen. Or if you uh, lose her email address, you can always reach out to Coab and we can connect you with Karen as well. Yeah. Um, well and you do no, receive... I did have a... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't no. mean to interrupt. <laughs> you do receive the recording link. Um, you'll receive... We'll also post the handouts, anything that's... in. Um, included with the webinar. Um, and you'll also receive your certificate, but please allow at least 24 hours after the live webinar ends, and then you'll receive your certificate in your email. So um, yeah, uh, Laura just found this session problematic. And I just wanted to address it really, really quickly. Um, people of color absolutely mentioned in these articles, I was blowing through this fast, we just had an hour. But if you downloaded that resource packet, there are so many people of color, so many black Americans that I have put into that resource packet and spent hours doing so because I 100% agree with you. People of color should always be referenced in discussions of race. And that is why Courtney Napier is the one who's created these materials. She generated the history. She is a very well-known speaker um, and teacher. I have taken courses from, from Courtney. Um, she's the one who created the core curriculum and absolutely um, she cites she is a black woman citing these sources. So I, I just want to disagree with you a little bit because those are cited as cited completely in that resource guide. Um, and I'm kind of doing an overview of what's, you know, in the short time that we have. So I would invite you to please, please, please look at the resource guide before you decide that this is willfully short. <laughs> so um, just wanted to address that real quick. Erin, um, we do, I do see some people where, where can they yeah. download the resource packet if you could. Yeah, it... I can. Let me get that link for you one more time okay. here. I've got it right here. So this is the one that I shared right at the beginning and it was, it'll be in this presentation. So when you receive a copy of the presentation, there is a QR code. And let me put this into the chat one more time. So this is the resource guide right here, core resource guide. It's about 22, 23 pages long. It's got a lot more information in it um, so with sources that are cited. And so you can you can go ahead and um, and do this, you know, download it, take a look at it, print it off. Um, and hopefully it gives you a lot more food for thought, um, things that you can that you can do. So wonderful. Thank you so much for attending. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and everyone have a great, I, I believe a lot of people have next week off. So if you're okay. off next week, have a great 4th of July. Um, and please reach out to Karen or Coabe um, if you have any questions. Okay, Excellent. thanks so much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you.